right, so welcome to the podcast, everybody. I have the luxury this afternoon of sitting here with Jamie Cassip. Hello. He is the Google Education Evangelist. For those of you that don't know him, I imagine most of our uh, listeners and watchers will know who you are. But uh, thank you so much. Welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk to us. Um, uh, tell us, first off, I, I think it's so interesting, your title, Chief uh, Educational evangelist what, right what does that mean what do you do for Google it doesn't mean anything right, so <laughs> so it's you know a technology term right there's lots of people in uh, Silicon Valley that have the uh, evangelist role right if you think about the word evangelist it's about bringing good news and for me it's about the good news of education as a silver bullet about the role that technology can play about the models that we need to change and honestly it was given to me by someone I was presenting in Michigan somewhere you know a generation ago and the uh, education director for the state of Michigan said you're not whatever my old title was right. you're an evangelist that's what you should be called and that's where it came from fantastic yeah. very cool um, so as I was as I was preparing for this and reading up and certainly I've, I've followed you and I've seen you at ISTE and conferences and this and that I was super intrigued to learn that you have recently started teaching uh, a high school 10th grade uh, high school classroom. So, uh, tell me about that. Is this your first time? Uh, yeah, as a K twelve teacher. As a K twelve teacher, it is. So, I I've, I've been teaching before I even started at Google. So, I've been teaching graduate classes and college classes at Arizona State University right. for since two thousand three, two thousand four. I, I always loved doing it. Um, and I was part of the team that helped build the school, the Phoenix Coding Academy. Right. And. You know, it's a little bit about putting your money, putting your money where your mouth is, kind of thing. Which is, Absolutely. if you need a critical skill, and I say communications is a critical skill, then I should probably do my part to teach kids communication skills. So I teach communication skills, but we did it in a way. Obviously, I can't be in the classroom every day. Right. I would die. But I, <laughs> I, I get to go every couple weeks. Every two weeks, I go and I do a whole day. I do three. So I'm teaching 90 kids over three classes for a day. So I'm there all day. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, every two weeks we're doing that. And I'm doing it between when school started all the way through May. I'm gonna do about 12 to 14 classes about helping them develop their communication skills. And I think, I wanna see where this goes in terms of, I think it's a great skill for 10th graders to go through. Because, you know, most of us know, everyone told me that 10th grade is the hardest grade to teach, right? right. Like out of all the students, 10th graders are the worst. Right? Yes, sir. They they know everything. Right. They're not as they're not as afraid as ninth graders. Right. But they haven't well, they figured out know, like 11 and 12. But they think they know the world. Right. right. And what's great about communication skills is that they realize that they don't know everything, and that you can see when they're like, they're all tough, and then they get up to speak, and they're like nervous and scared. And yeah. So I think it's a great way to kind of like bring them balance and level them down uh, because it teaches them how to get feedback, how to look for feedback, how to, so we spent, we spent the first couple of classes just finding good presentations, like what is a good presentation? Then we spent last week putting together the criteria for what is a good presentation, but they build it, I let them build it. Right, right? I'm not right, gonna right. show them an evaluation that this is what you should even be evaluated on. I wanted them to build what the evaluation will be like. And so they created the criteria that they use. So it's been great. I, lo I love it. Fantastic. Well, I'm also great. tired at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I can. I'm very familiar yeah, with that. Yeah. I can relate. Right, right. Um, fantastic. So I taught. I taught mostly ninth graders for about 15 years. But I did do. Uh, I did do a couple of years with uh, geometry and, and U.S. history in right. the tenth grade. So right. here in Georgia. So. Well, I'm trying to also be lazy, right? Which is. I'm trying to be a good coach and let them do the work. Right. right. I'm not gonna. I don't want to do the work for them. Right. So it's not a lot of lecturing. I'm not. It's more about letting them find stuff. It's about having them explain why they find something and what they like about it. Having them actually do the work. So I put them in teams a lot and let them work together. That's fantastic. And those are the skills that, of course, they're going to need. Yeah. Whether they're going to college or going to work afterwards, whatever yeah. their whatever their trajectory takes them, um, those are certainly worthwhile skills they'll put, be able to put to use. Yeah. yeah. So. Fantastic. So, what, uh, what one of the questions on our podcast here? In a, our podcast is called Education 3.0, uh, and we are. I'm going to tell you a little bit about us. If you've talked to David Lockhart, mm -hmm. um, 
So we, we work directly with teachers in K-12 schools on what we're calling personalized learning. Um, and so uh, that's a lot of what we do. And so I started putting out the podcast uh, to talk to our coaches. There's about 53 coaches right now that are all employed and we're all out in schools around and around the metro Atlanta area. Um, and just kind of talking about uh, how is coaching different from teaching and kind of what are some strategies and some skills that you're using to uh, to build teacher leaders and, and to, to build up in, in your schools. Uh, and one of the questions I ask all my coaches when we talk to them is, is kind of describe your average day. So I'm, I'm curious as to what, what what's the average day for Jamie Kasselberg like? Right? Well, I, I want to come back to the idea of coaching versus teaching. We're going to okay. come back to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's an important topic. Um, so my, my typical day, it, it, it always depends. So typically, I'm spending most of my time on the road. I travel 200,000 miles. So this week, I started uh, Sunday. I was I left to go to Detroit, and I was in Detroit on Monday. And then I had to go back to Phoenix to sit on a workforce development panel in Phoenix on Tuesday. Flew out here yesterday for this. Uh, and flying back tonight to Phoenix to keynote the Librarian Association conference tomorrow. Cool. And then Friday, going to go yell at superintendents in LA for, for the day, right? So that's not a typical week, but I've had lots of those kinds of weeks where you have no idea where you are. Right. And it's five cities, five days. Yeah, and, and I spend most of my time just trying to catch up to things, right? Trying to catch up to emails or trying to catch up to things. And I, I like to write a lot, so I try to use airplane time to write. A typical day at home is literally catching up to everything because I spend so much time on the road that when I'm home, I do all my meetings, I, I catch up on, like if you look at my desk, my desk is covered with research and books and things that I've been reading and you know where your good ideas come from, comes right. from the stuff that you read. So I yes. try to spend as much time reading as I can. And then I teach classes. Yeah. <laughs> and then you got these. And then I teach. You got these 90 10th graders, graders that do they do they kind of understand the. Do they know who you are? Are they kind of... Yeah, know? well, so I'm one of the founders of the school, so they get that. Uh, and they're starting to get to know me. And, they, you know, I, I like to tell people that I'm in the limited uh, experience I had in K-12 of teaching, I, I'm equating it to golf. And this is what I mean by that. Which is, I'm terrible at golf. And you go play golf and you can be terrible all day and you hit just one shot that hits the middle of the fairway. <laughs> That's what you're talking like, about. Yes! <laughs> I'm coming back for this, right? And I've had a couple of those moments teaching where I'm like, I am terrible at this. This I'm I'm horrible, I'm horrible, I'm horrible. And then a kid comes up to you after class like, hey, I'm gonna get a lot out of your class. I really appreciate it. You're like, yes! Right. Right? So it's a lot like that, right? So it, you have those moments. So they know who I am. They they I'm sure they've done their research. Sure. Um, but I, I'm trying to I to be a coach for them, right? It's back to that idea. Right. right? It's this idea that I get the question all the time: Are you know teachers going to be replaced by technology? No, right. they're not ever. Because I think the role of the teacher is even more important in this world that we're building. And the role of the teacher needs to move to this coaching model, right? So I do not like when teachers are described as facilitators, right? Like you, I've heard that before. Like, we need to move away from being a whatever on the right. facilitator. Right. I have a problem with that word because I think about a basketball game. Who's a, who's a facilitator in a basketball game? It's the referee, right? The referee is facilitating the game. They're making sure that the game goes smoothly. They're calling the, the plays, the, the, the good plays, the bad plays, the whole thing. Right. But they don't care who wins. They don't care what the outcome is. They want as neutral as possible. The Hopefully. facilitator is a neutral person, right? Right. I'm facilitator. I want a coach. I, I want I want I want the person not playing the game, but being so involved and so in, engaged in the game that they're also sweating and they're right. also getting the emotion and the feeling. Right. So I think about it, if you think about a basketball game, I think of the of the teacher as closer to the coach than the referee. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, Let's stay on the topic of coaching. So I know that um, that Google has recently partnered with uh, Digital Promise uh -huh. in this dynamic learning project. Are you involved in that in I any am, way? I am. Uh, Liz Anderson is the person who's running that team, and I meet with her every couple of weeks. Um, I'll be more involved as it moves on. Right. But I, I have the program has my full support. 
Fantastic. So that's recently reached out to D Digital Promise as well because you know, that's what we do. Yeah. Um, right now they're in a pilot phase, right? They're, right. they're experimenting to see what... First thing you have to prove is that this is real, right? right. Which is we need people in schools that are uh, good at the use of technology, but more importantly, the, the good at being able to help teachers integrate the technology into what they do. And if we find that that helps, then we'll expand the program. Right, absolutely. And I think collecting that data piece is, is the key thing to it as well. Right. Being able to have that data to back to see, it up. Yeah, yeah. To see yeah. what works and what doesn't work. Absolutely. Right. Fantastic. I, and I love, I just, I grew up out in Dallas, Texas. And I'm, I'm in the process of maybe planning a trip because uh, Dallas Independent Schools is doing a lot of stuff with, with personalized learning right now. Okay. Um, and I've got a childhood friend who's in DISD and, and got her hands all in that. But okay. my, uh, my junior high, my eighth grade junior high is one of the 50 schools oh, nice. uh, that was selected for that project. So I'm hoping to get back and, uh, and revisit them up, oh, in, nice. uh, up in Carrollton Farmers Branch. Um, so um, uh, let's talk a little about your uh, inquiry-driven, project-based model. You talk a lot yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, how does that fit into personalized learning, and what is the, the coach's role, if you will? If it's teacher as coach, right. how, does, how does the coach fit into that model? Right. Um, and, and how does that look different from, you know, if we were to walk into a classroom today where a teacher says, you know, we're, we're doing a project-based, you know, X, right. whatever. Right. How do you see that as being different? Yeah, so look, I, I like that we're talking about personalized learning. I want us to get to personal learning. Right? Personalized learning can sometimes still mean I take this great content and I figure out how to deliver it to you. Where personal learning is, I, there's these ideas that I want you to learn, but I'm gonna let you drive the learning. Right? Right. I'm gonna let you figure out what, what you're interested in. Right? Sure. So that's one of the things that we're doing with the communication class, right? I'm not. I said bring a great presentation and to demonstrate a great presentation. I didn't say what, I didn't give them any the parameters, I didn't tell them anything. I just told them to find what they thought good presenters were. Some people brought in comedians, some people brought in singers and poetry readers, right? Like, like, like this idea that it's personal to them, that they're going to learn from something that they can relate to, that may be culturally significant, right? That's an issue that we don't really talk a lot about. Right. Um, so I want us to move more of that. So to me, you know, Inquiry-based learning is is trying your old as close to being three years old as possible, right? That's really like, like there's nobody who drives learning more than a little kid, right? Right. You know, she she's like, you are. She's always asking questions. She's always doing things. She's always like curious about what's going on, and I want kids to continuously have that because at the end of the day. That curiosity is what is going to be an important skill to have in the future. Right. So what what are the, I like what you said about that. We've actually I think um, I think one of the things that needs to happen is a common common vocabulary, a common syntax. You know, I think your definition or your description of personal learning sounds very similar to how we at iTeach describe or define personalized learning. We're very I think. I think a common syntax. But if you walk around these, and you walk around this, and you see what personalized learning is, it's oh, not the same there's thing. There's 50 different definitions right, of it. Right. You're absolutely right. right. Uh, we're working hard on trying to, to, you know, to marry the right. syntax right. so that it fits. Uh, so that when I say it, when you say it, and they say it, we all know that we're saying the same things. Well, personalized learning is still content to student. Student-driven learning. Student-driven learning is student to content. I think. That could be an interesting way of doing it, right? Oh, like, yeah, yeah. We definitely student, describe it as student-driven. Student, driven student, driven student yeah, yeah we're, we're definitely a student-driven um, agency uh, right. is what we're looking for. So so what has to happen? Because a, a lot of what we're looking at these days are policies, whether they're local, state, or national, and kind of barriers to making, you know, personal learning personalized learning to making these things happen you know a lot of um, what are what are we testing you know we've got this triangle of, of assessment that are you know we're teaching the test and we say we want to teach one thing but we're testing a different thing what are, what are you doing or what is google doing um, at, a, at a local state or even national level to kind of drive that conversation and that change at those levels well, I think it's an important topic because, well, the best I think that Google can do 
is to provide the tools and the platforms to do what, to give teachers the opportunity to do what they want, right? Right. So, you can argue all you want for personal learning, you can argue all you want for A, B, and C, but if you don't have the platform or you don't have the tools to do that, it's hard to do. So at the, right. at the very least, what we can do is provide the opportunity and the platform to do that. What I'm personally doing is having that same argument, right? Which is, when I talk to a governor, for example, we'll ask him, if he's telling me about an education program, I'll, I'll ask him, how does this benefit the student? Like, what's in it for the student? Right. And we can all be asking that question on a policy level. Most of the things that you just mentioned aren't for students at all, it's for adults. Right. Standardized testing is not for students. Right. Students aren't testing feedback and doing something with it. Correct. We're using that data for something else. Yeah. So, it's not that I don't believe in standardized testing, I just don't believe that that's the methodology we should use for students, right? Students need a different kind of assessment. So I can yell at them. So I was in a, I was in a meeting or a, this workforce development thing yelling about just that, that at the end of the day, it's about policies that we need to change to give teachers the space in the room to do the things that we really want to do. On Friday, it's the superintendent summit, and I'm going to go yell at them about making sure, because what they control is the space that you guys get, right? The space right. that teachers get to do things the way they want to do things. And my argument is going to be this. I have worked at Google for 12 years. I, before Google, I was at Accenture, where I worked for seven years, and I worked in banking. And before that, I was at, uh, working for Governor Cuomo in New York. So I worked in government, banking, finance, healthcare, electronics and high tech, education. So I worked across all these different workforces. Right. And there is no more passionate and dedicated workforce than teachers. Right. Period. It's not, second isn't even close. Amen. Right? Like firefighters are, would be second, right? Like, like there's not one more passionate about what they do than right. teachers. Nobody in the finance world cries when they talk about their work. Right. Right? I have friends who complain about forgetting to charge in their $6 coffee while teachers are spending $1,500 out of their own pocket to buy crayons, right? Like, right. Let's, let's let them loose. Right. Let's, let's not tell them what to do. Let's let them tell us what to do, right? Let's give them the opportunity to open them up. So it's part of it is a communication issue. Part of it is an awareness issue. Like, there is no more dedicated group. What happens if we open up the space for them to say, okay, what do you want to do? How do you want to do this? And what do we do to support you and help you? That's right. That's fantastic. I love, I love that you, you said that testing is for, for parents. When I was... Uh, it's not even for parents, it's for like mostly for, for adults. adults. Yeah, yeah. but uh, the, the, the biggest pushback I got in the classroom when I tried new and innovative things were parents who didn't understand, right? right. That, that age old, that's not how we did it. Sure, sure. When I was like, in school. If you, go, if you move to uh, we, uh, at the Phoenix Coding Academy, we're trying, to, we're trying a non grade system, right? And parents are like, I don't understand what meets expectations means. Does that mean a B? Like they want to know the letter grade. Right. But that's the old world. Right. Yeah. Right. That, that's brilliant. We we definitely talk about that in our in our vision of personalized sure. learning as well, multi age. So what, so what I say to parents is, what grade did you get in your job performance last year? Right. Like, what are you talking about? I didn't get, no, you got an assessment. You got right. Here's the things you do really well. Here's yeah. what you need to improve upon. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we do the same thing with kids? Yeah. That's what I tell parents. And you work with people who have ten years more experience than you, and yeah. Yeah. who have ten years less experience than you. Right. And you right. seem to be okay. Yeah. It works right. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, so you mentioned that you're reading a lot, books all over you. So, what yeah. are you reading today? You got a favorite or? A so, so I read. I read a lot of. So, I on my list right now as we go into the holiday season because this is what I like to read. Is I haven't read the End of Average yet. I'm gonna read that. Okay. I heard that's a really good book. The end of Average. The End of Average is a really good book. Um, I um, I'm lucky enough that uh, Daniel Pink said he's gonna send me his new book when. Uh, an advanced copy of it, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm also reading um, Al Franken's book, uh, The Great Senator, I forget what it's called, but I'm a big Al Franken fan, yeah. so I'm reading his book. And then the book that I'm really looking forward to is Dan Brown's new book. I almost never read fiction. Yeah. And I, uh, The Originals, I think it's called. Or, or no, not The Originals, uh, The Origin, I think it's called. Is he the Da Vinci Code? Yeah, yeah. So I love. So I read those books too. And so I'm looking. So that's the like hangout book. The yeah. sitting on the couch. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. So I've got a good friend who works for Franken. Oh really? Up in DC. She's a. Uh, I don't even know. Julie, you'll kill me if you're listening to this. I can't. 
think of what it is you do, but she's uh, <laughs> she's probably told you a thousand times. Yeah, she's a uh, she's a former. I taught high school with her uh, uh, here in North Atlanta. And she moved to DC, finished her doctorate, taught some college things around here and there, and, and is right. doing policy stuff. I think he's awesome. For Franken right. in, in DC. I yeah. think I think he's a great model. Like you take someone who used to be a comedian. And what he did for six years is he shut that down and became serious. Yeah. And there's no one that shows you the benefit of preparing, reading, and being ready and listening. Like, and the reason why he gets to ask the questions that he asks and he, and he gets to catch people in this is because he's actually listening to people. Right. He's actually listening to your answer. He doesn't have his answer yet. He's going to react to whatever you say. Yeah. Nobody does it better than him. Yeah. It's fantastic. I'm a big fan of his. Fantastic. Well, Jamie, I know you're a busy man. I don't want to take all your time. I really appreciate you sitting down with us today. Sure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, coming to the conference. We're glad you're here. Yeah, it's good. I'm going to walk around the exhibit hall, see what's here. Fantastic. Well, thank right. you so very much. Jamie Cassip, everybody. He's thank on Twitter. You. He's he's all over everywhere. Reach <laughs> out and say hey. On an airplane. Find me on an airplane. Thanks, all. <laughs>